Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of drawing near to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Spirit, whom you've sent to us to live in us. Lord, thank you that we can draw near with full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Help us to hold our confession uh, steadfastly because you are faithful to your words. You are faithful to your own character. In all your actions, in all your decree, you are faithful to your goodness and to your greatness. Fill our hearts with these realities this morning. And don't let them just be truths that will make us puffed up with knowledge, but let these truths build us up to be better fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, children and students, workers, world transformers and culture changers. Help us to take our stand on Christian doctrine. And Lord, help us to be proud of our confessional heritage. And from that stance, uh, do much good in the name of Jesus. Uh, please equip us this morning, we pray. It's no light matter handling the truths of God's word. And I pray that especially the topic of God's decree, as misunderstood and mishandled and as easy as it is to misrepresent, I pray that your spirit would be here among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, um, please raise your hand if you do not have a question sheet. Okay. Um, so, for those of you in the back, there's a stack on the music stand. I don't see anyone with their hand raised in the front. So, um, if, you, if you keep your hands up, if you see someone with their hand raised, kindly uh, distribute. Also, if you need a copy of the confession, there's also some on the, on the music stand back there. Okay, thank you. Well... Yesterday, or yester Sunday, last week, we left off on uh, Roman numeral two, question two. Uh, we'll pick up from there. We reflected last time on the doctrine that God decrees all things, but he's not the author of sin, nor does he cancel the freedom of human responsibility or um, our accountability for the choices we make. There is an apparent tension in Scripture, therefore, between human freedom and God's sovereignty. Uh, in the way that Scripture presents this doctrine, these two doctrines. Paragraph 2 of the Confession sets out to protect the doctrine of God's decree from erroneous human attempts to resolve the apparent tension, which Scripture does not try to resolve. What I'm saying is, trying to hold the doctrine of God's sovereignty in tension, as Scripture does, is hard. And what people often try to do is um, give some slack by putting one of them, by muting one of the doctrines and upholding the other. So if you uphold God's sovereignty and you kind of mute human responsibility, that's the error of hyper-Calvinism, which, among many things, uh, says that you don't need to give the free offer of the gospel because God's going to just do what he does anyway. Or if you um, give some slack and try muting the doctrine of God's sovereignty and you kind of put human responsibility higher, you fall into the error of Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, and Arminianism, which we'll kind of talk about a little bit today. Um, which some uh, have said basically put man as the author of his salvation, more or less. Now, you gotta be careful when you say that because there's different strands of Arminianism. 
and we don't want to mischaracterize. The last thing we want to do is mischaracterize. But Scripture doesn't necessarily try to solve the problem. It holds these things in tension, and so should we. That's the point. So we left off last time on question two, which says, what, uh, what is certainly not the basis for God's decree? And I'm just going to recap what we said. Let's, let's look at paragraph two of chapter three of the London Baptist Confession. Again, they're on the back music stand, and the question sheets are there too. Paragraph two starts like this. And with your permission, I'm going to change the uh, Middle English uh, or Modern English uh, verb, conjug verb conjugations, like knoweth to know, so with your permission. So it says, although God knows whatsoever may or can come to pass upon all supposed conditions, yet he has not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions anyway. So why did God choose me? The classic response of high Arminianism is that he chose me because he foresaw my faith, my future faith. This is an unbiblical attempt at solving what in scripture is not a problem. Arminianism appeals to our desire to be told that we can basically save ourselves. It puts the distinguishing choice of God, it bases that distinguishing choice of God on something you've done, on something you've done. Paragraph two, however, addresses this in related errors. It tells us what was not the basis of God's decree uh, for anything. God does not decree based on foreknowledge of things that will happen. That's the point of paragraph two. God foreknows what will happen because he decreed it. In other words, God does not look down through the corridors of time to see who will believe in him and then say, ah, look how devout and full of faith so-and-so will be. I will, I will choose that person to salvation. No, rather, as paragraph two says, that person is full of faith and devout because God decreed it. God foreknows that so-and-so will believe because he decreed it. In other words, God's knowledge of the future is due to his decree of the future. Um, so let's get into some of the scripture passages cited in your confession. You really should have a copy in your hands. It's going to be hard to follow this course if you don't. They're on the back music stand. Um, we have here Romans 9, 11, 13, 16, and 18. I underlined what the confession writers uh, cited, but um, the part that's not underlined is the context. <laughs> we need context. So let's look at this. And here, the point again is God decrees the future not based on his foreknowledge of what people would do in the future, but based on the counsel of his own will. So Romans 9. Though they, Jacob and Esau, were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, she being Rebecca. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Exodus 33 and 34, remember? The fountain for so much echoed in so many other scriptures. Paul is a student of Exodus 33 and 34, verse 16. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Uh, 
Out of all the verses here cited, we'll probably have the most trouble with verse 13, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. I'm going to paraphrase and quote John Murray on this. God's holy hatred is not like human personal animosity. That would be blasphemy. We can compare it to human righteous hatred that expresses, quote, holy jealousy for God's honor and love to him. We make this comparison only to show that even in us men, there is a hate that is entirely distinct from malicious and vindictive hatred. Murray continues, the hate of verse 13 belongs to the transcendent realm of God's sovereignty for which there is no human analogy. We're grasping for analogies here. What can be said is that in the context of the statement, which is Paul's quotation of God's oracle to Rebecca, God's love and hate of Jacob and Esau is determinative of their destinies. Paul's point is that God's sovereign counsel determines man's destiny, not God's foreknowledge of their character or actions in the future. That's the point. Paul's point is that God's sovereign counsel determines man's destiny, not his foreknowledge of what their character will be like or their actions. Paul knows that this doctrine is objectionable to many of us. But notice that instead of answering the objection, Paul deals with the irreverent attitude behind the objection. Listen to this. Paul was a teacher and a preacher, and he's been in many cities before he wrote this letter. And he's probably had not a few people in the audience say, wait a minute, verse 19, why does he find fault still? Who can resist his will, right? Paul knows we're going to ask the question. Paul knows we're going to have difficulty with this. Same context. Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated. Maybe your objection will sound different. How can God do that? Why does he still blame me if whatever I do has been decreed? Now, does Paul have an answer for us? Yeah. The rest of scripture does too. The confession traces and unfolds this out. But Paul doesn't even give an answer to the question. He deals with the irreverent attitude behind the question. That's what he uses the expensive ink and papyrus on. Like, he had a choice of either answering the question or dealing with the attitude. He dealt with the attitude. Look at this. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Paul doesn't answer the question. He addresses the attitude, which implies for us that when we're studying the things of God, we always, probably especially on the decree of God, we have to do heart checks much more frequently along the way than when we're studying the grace of God or the goodness of God. Oh, maybe just as equally so, actually. But you get the point. Um, this is not one of the confession scriptures, but it's in the context and it's important. So paragraph two begins to address theological errors that arise out of attempts to solve the apparent tension in scripture between God's sovereignty and our responsibility. Specifically, we're not the authors of our own salvation, as if God's decree in eternity depends on what he foresaw us to do in time. It says that God's decree is independent based not on what's outside of him, but based wholly on what's in him. His decree is based entirely on himself, on his most holy counsel. So now, paragraph 5, and, you, and we're skipping around because our approach is not... Uh, expository, it's application. So I'm skipping around. Paragraph five further develops paragraph two, this idea that you're not the author of your own salvation. Paragraph five answers the question, why me? Why did God choose me? So we're going to go to paragraph five. Before that, um, I'm going to give a little excursus on 
Pelagianism and Arminianism because I've thrown around the terms and it's not fair. Um, so I at least want you to have a face to the name of Pelagianism and Arminianism. And um, let me just say that I've had professors who are Arminians, who are uh, great scholars and um, exemplary Christians. Um, you even remember what Whitfield said about John Wesley when someone said, is he even going to be in heaven? Are you going to see him in heaven? And Whitfield said, no, I'm not going to see him. And the other person said, yes, he said something bad about Wesley. No. And he explained, no, I'm not going to see him because Wesley will be so close to God and so eclipsed by the glory of God that I won't even see him. So let's have a spirit of charity as we talk about these things. But for Pelagianism, we don't have to have charity. So um, let's look at this. So Pelagianism. Pelagius was a British monk in the fourth century AD. That was the unorthodox influencer behind Pelagianism. His theological error, humans are untainted by sin. Grace is the same thing as free will. We can basically be righteous by our own efforts, yada, yada, Google it. Okay, it's bad. Uh, the orthodox responder was Augustine. Um, Augustine wrote three books in response to these errors. Again, Pelagius is trying to solve the problem that scripture never tries to solve of lowering God's sovereignty and totally elevating human responsibility. But he's in the process, he destroys the doctrine of sin. He destroys the doctrine of grace. It's, it's all over the place. It's messy, okay? Um, so writings on sin and grace were the Orthodox Correction. Those are Augustine's books written in 412 to 415. And even the Pope, the Pope condemns it. Um, although this wasn't the kind of Romanistic Pope probably that we would expect, but Pelagianism, bad, okay? Pelagianism basically says <laughs> Adam's sin only pertained to him. When we're born, we are all a perfect blank slate. Our souls are untainted. And you can save yourself by being righteous enough. You are the author of your own salvation. Pelagianism, bad, bad, bad. <laughs> um, some people who are really against Arminianism and kind of are in a cage stage, they'll call Arminianism semi-Pelagianism. But, you know, let's not be hasty with our words. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say all Arminian strains are semi-Pelagianism, but uh, when we talk about Arminianism, there's a face behind the word. We have a man in Netherlands in the um, 17th century, Jacob Arminius, Jacob Arminius, and he was very influential. Actually, his, his doctrine was very evangelical, and uh, it would be very hard to distinguish his writings from, like, some very solid people today, all right? So he's not, he's not evil, <laughs> okay? Let's, um, but Jacob Arminius, um, his followers and uh, the way that his thought was developed, uh, especially after his death, uh, here's one version of Arminianism, okay? Here's one version. God's choice of you is conditioned upon your faith. The cross of Christ makes salvation possible if you believe. Calvinism would teach that the cross of Christ definitively saved a set of people. When Christ said it is finished, that was a speech act, that was performative, that did something for a set of people right there and then. Definite atonement. Arminianism would say, no, the cross of Christ made salvation possible for everyone. And as Jesus was dying, perhaps, he really, really hoped, you know, that a lot of people would believe in him. Because if they did, then they'd be saved. Are you guys, I think, I think you guys, okay. So, uh, and there are other, um, other points in a document and in, in, uh, some thought called the Remonstrant, the Dutch Remonstrants, but uh, those were five complaints against Calvinism. Uh, and some bad forms of it, like hyper-Calvinism. So they had concerns. Um, Orthodox responder, Franciscus Gomaris, 
and 100 plus delegates at the Synod of Dort. I mean, the Synod of Dort, 1618 to 1619, um, there were 11 um, Armenian representatives uh, who came and um, they would argue their case, but the delegates would pose questions, but the Armenian, Ar Armenian delegates wouldn't answer the questions. They just kept sort of like attacking Calvinism and they're like, bro, bro, answer the questions. By the second week, they were not invited back. And the Synod of Dort just asked them to send in a document of what they believed. So there were, there were attempts even to articulate what Armenians believe at the Synod. And it was, it was too messy even to get them to nail down what they believed. So they sent in a document, the, the delegates, it was an international delegation, and they came up with the Canons of Dort. You can read it online. This is where the five points of Calvinism came from. John Calvin didn't make the five points of Calvinism. It's, it's uh, from the uh, Synod of Dort, 1618-19. So when I say Arminianism, I'm saying the idea that Christ's death on the cross made salvation possible, but the real factor, the real determining factor is your faith. Like the steering wheel is in your hands. Like yeah, prevenient grace uh, prepares you to believe, but really it's up to you. Um, and that God's choice of you, God's election of you is conditioned uh, upon his foresight into the future of what you'll do. Basically meaning that God's choice God's decree is based on what's outside of him. Which our confession saying, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. God's decree is never based on what's outside of him. It's based on what's in him. So when we go to question 2b, it says, how does the freeness of God's decree apply to the election of people unto salvation? Look at paragraph 5. We're going to read part of it. The whole thing, actually. Paragraph 5. Those of mankind that are predestined to life, God, before the foundation of the world was laid, according to his eternal and immutable purpose and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, has chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory out of his mere free grace and love without any other thing in the creature as a condition or cause moving him thereunto. Point here is, God predestines people to salvation unconditionally, not according to anything in them, but rather according to what is in him. It's out of his good pleasure that God unconditionally elects sinners to salvation. So the doctrine of unconditional election is what we're looking at right now. Uh, why me? Why did God choose me? So this doctrine of unconditional election says that God decrees the salvation of men not according to anything in them, but according to his good pleasure. Think again, uh, as we saw on Ephesians 1, 11. Uh, Look at that, verse 11. Uh, we have been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. He works all things according to what he sees in the future that you'll do and how your character will be? According to things outside of him? No, 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 no. He works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Uh, John Calvin on, on this section says, God, God's election doesn't happen because we've come to him or sought him. But as Isaiah says, God shows himself to those who did not seek him and were far off. God says to them, although you have despised me, yet I have condescended to come to you because I care for your salvation. How then do we come to God? How do we obey him? How do we have a quiet mind that yields itself to him in accordance with faith? He must do everything himself, end quote. So when God looks at us, what does he see? Calvin continues, God could not see anything in us except the evil that was there, for there was not one drop of goodness for him to find. Why still elect us then? We must regard the election, he says, as a very clear token of God's free grace. 
So in other words, God loves us not because of what he found in us, but because he loves us. Um, Look at Deuteronomy 7. God loves us because he loves us. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh in Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Another echo of Exodus 34, just saying. Look at this. Look, look at the syntax. It was not because you were more in number that the Lord set his love on you. He loved you because he loved you. <laughs> That's the reason. In other words, love is a sovereign thing. It has no conditions. If your spouse asks you, why do you love me? And if you start saying things beginning with, well, you're punctual, um, the dishes are spotless, an eavesdropper could suspect your love might be a little hallmarkish, right? Love is a sovereign thing. You'd love your spouse because you did. God says, I love you because I love you. It's not you, it's me. I love you. <laughs> Nothing in you, it's me, God says. So, <laughs> Scripture uses the doctrine of God's loving election to make us strong in the face of suffering. You might be asking, okay, Ian, where is this going? You know, this is a lot of stuff you're throwing at us, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you guys two verses, and uh, they're both from Paul's letters, and it answers the question, so what? Okay, God loves me so much. He elected me based on his unconditional will. Nothing in me. So what? Here's what. Look at first, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 8 and 9. Paul writes, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Context of suffering. Context of present trials. Context of perplexing changes in the world. Remind you of anything that we're going through? Now look how the doctrine of election is used to make us strong in the face of trials. This stuff's practical, people. Look. Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Your salvation, God's love for you, is built on the eternal cornerstones of his counsel that can't change. And so will you waver and fall and shake because of coronavirus? Because of a, a, um, a list of other things? that disturb us in your family, in your country, in your region because of suffering? This stuff is practical. I'm just trying to show you guys that verse 9, which our confession pulls out as a proof text, is in the context of comforting believers through suffering. One more and then a question. Verse 30, our confession pulls that out. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Listen, you were predestined to salvation. You're going to be justified. You're justified. You're going to be glorified. Nothing can break that chain. But look at the context also. How is Paul using this doctrine? Verse 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Don't, don't, don't think that the present situation is the end of God's kindness to you. Verse 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 32, he didn't spare his son. So who's going to separate you from his love? 
Verse 37, no, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us with a love that says, it's just because I loved you. Not because of anything in you. Here's my question to you. When was the last time the doctrine of God's sovereign grace for you made you bold in the face of suffering, made you look in the mirror and say, I'm not going to stay in bed today. I'm going to get up. I'm going to face the world because God loves me. Has the doctrine of election just been a contentious issue in which you fling labels around? Or has it been a well of comfort in distressing situations? That's how scripture uses it. When was the last time you used it that way? The doctrine of election in any doctrine is not intended to make us know-it-alls. It's intended to make us stronger people, kinder people, more ethical people. Joseph said, I'm not going to take revenge on you. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Doctrine grounds our ethics. When was the last time this, this doctrine put shoes on and walked in your life? Put shoes on it and walk. So in Roman numeral three, we move on. And, and now we're getting to some other practical points. I know it's cruel for me not to ask if anyone has questions, but I really am trying to move on. I was hoping to finish this week. So Roman numeral three says, in his decree, God ordains the means and the end. Question three says, what are the means God has ordained toward the end goal of the salvation of the elect. And we're going to look at paragraph six now. Paragraph six. Uh, bear with me as I read it, please. As God has appointed the elect unto glory, so he has by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained all the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ, by his spirit working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation. Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, or effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. Here's the point. God has predestined sinners to eternal life. As, as he has done that, he has foreordained the means. In other words, God's decree of salvation as a goal includes also the means to that goal. Scripturally, God has ordained the means as well as the end. So, salvation of sinners, that's the goal of election. That's the goal. But God also ordains certain means to be used toward accomplishing that goal. First, Christ's cross work, Christ's work on the cross, that had to be done to accomplish what God decreed in eternity. That was one of the means. Second, the Spirit invading your heart and applying the blood of Christ. Third, justification. Fourth, adoption. You read it. Fifth, sanctification, in which we work at pursuing holiness and exercising our faith. You have to pursue holiness in order to be saved. You have to persevere in order to be saved. And, and six, God's preservation of us as we persevere by faith. Here's just a few of those means. Um, not those means. Um, here's a few of those means. Christ had to die still. 1 Thessalonians 5. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. Christ still had to die. God ordained the means to our salvation, as well as the goal of that eternal blessed state of glory. Or, or what about sanctification and faith? We still have to exercise faith. We still have to pursue holiness. 2 Thessalonians 2, God chose you as first fruits to be saved 
through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You still have to pursue holiness. It's by the Spirit, but it's also by your evangelical effort. And, and, and then prayer. John 17, Christ is praying for us. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Without prayer, without Christ's prayer, our prayers. So God ordains the means as well as the end. Um, in verse, uh, verse, not a verse, but the next question. Answer this question according to paragraph six. Now my aunt asked me this in the year 2012 and I had no idea how to answer it. I still remember, I was sitting on my couch, she was going through a hard time in her life and she said, I've prayed and I've prayed and nothing's happened. And Ian, I was telling her about my newfound theological interest and she said, Ian, if God already decreed all things, why should I, and then fill in the blank, why should I read my Bible? Why should I pray? Why should I evangelize? Anyone have anything else to fill in the blank with? Why should I come to church? Boom. Why should I come to church? That's a big one today, actually. Why should I care? Why should I care? So, answer that question according to paragraph six. I'll, I'll hand it over to you guys for a couple minutes. Logan, is that a stretch or a hand uh, raise? Well, Caught you. That's legitimate, because God said so. Yeah. All right? Absolutely. Um, if God already decreed all these things, if he already knows who's going to be on this side and who's going to be on that side, why should I even... Uh, Peter. Yeah. Because we don't, if we don't know who they are, you know, if we knew who they were, then that would be a different story. But yeah. We don't know who they are. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if there's any other. Yeah, sorry. So, so the doctrine of concurrence yeah. is the doctrine that doesn't solve the problem, but it explains that God acts, but as was mentioned a moment ago, we too. Yeah. And if God is the creator and we are the created, and everything around us is created, that does not negate hmm. contingencies and conditions, etc. Yeah. That that the the artist painted when he was a mural. That's right. Our our confession so far has given us oh, go ahead, Luke. Yeah. Amen. Almost, uh, uh, almost developing what Logan said, right? He, he, said, he said you should. And the chief end of man is to glorify God. Right? Um, I, so, and, and these are all, these all unfold from our confession. Our confession has told us enough already to understand how to answer this question. Um, God has ordained the means as well as the ends. God has determined the salvation of, of the elect along with the means of preaching, along with the means of praying, along with the means of evangelizing, along with the means of reading your Bible. God has ordained those means. God has ordained that we do those too. That's how he's constructed his universe. And that's the God that we have. And one writer says, 
to glory in the end without fulfilling the means would be inconsistent and sinful by disobedience. So to say, oh, God already decreed everything and we can just like chill, that cuts directly against the fact that God also ordained the means. Why should I pray if God already decided all things? Because part of his decree is that you pray. Why should I evangelize if God has already decreed all things? Because comprehended in his decree is that you'll evangelize. Do you guys see where paragraph six is? Paragraph six talks about Christ's cross, the Spirit's work, but it also talks about sanctification. Like, like watch what you <laughs> say and do, and right? Because God has ordained those means. So let's hasten to the last Roman numeral. The goal of God's decree is his glory and our good. The goal of God's decree is his, decor is his glory and our good. Question four says, what is God's ultimate goal in predestining some men and angels to eternal life? We're looking at paragraphs three and four. Paragraph three, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated or foreordained to eternal life through Jesus Christ, to the praise of his glorious grace. Others being left to act in their sin to their just condemnation, to the praise of his glorious justice. Paragraph four, these angels and men thus predestinated and foreordained are particularly and unchangeably designed and their number so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or diminished. So here's the point of both of those. Whether men are predestined to life or passed by in their sin, God will be praised. For predestining some to life, the glory of his grace will be praised. For leaving people to act in their sin to their condemnation, the glory of his justice will be praised. I'm going to give one verse and then give some cautions about that statement as it's written here. Jude 4 says, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, how does Jude characterize these people? Look at the middle who pervert the grace of God into sensuality and deny Christ, right? So they're sensual and they're denying Christ. Question, did God work against their wills to make them sensual and to deny Christ? No, our confession has already said, God is not the author of evil. It cited James one, nor does he have fellowship with evil. God does not work against their wills to follow sensuality and to deny Christ. They do these things according to their own desires, but God chooses to leave them in the course of the sins they've chosen. Here's a caution, and this is just a general caution about language. The syntactic parallelism in the last sentence of paragraph three, um, some men predestined to life, will be to the praise of his grace. Others left to act in their sin will be to the praise of his justice. Um, that's packaged very neatly in parallel. Here's my caution. In scripture, the way that election and damnation are presented is not so parallel as the confession points out, as the confession has it. Confession packages it neatly, and election and reprobation. Election prays for his grace, reprobation prays for his justice. Let's all go home, hallelujah, right? But in scripture, there's asymmetry. Um, here's, what I'm, here's what I'm talking about. Yes, both election and damnation depend on the unchangeable, wise, holy, eternal will of God, but in themselves, election and damnation differ considerably. Okay, here are the few of those differences. Election rests on the redeeming love of God to save the lost, but damnation rests on the moral necessity to show the universe that sin is ugly and has consequences. They rest on different things. The ground of election is the sovereign will of God and that alone, 
but the ground of damnation to which the reprobate are consigned is sin and sin alone. That's from John Murray. Means are used to fulfill the purpose of election, but God uses no means to fulfill his purpose of reprobation. It's left to sin. It is left to sin to run its course and receive its wages. And then the elect constitute a new race under a new head, but the reprobate, those passed by, are but the branches cut off from the tree of humanity. Okay, so even though there's this neat parallelism, in the last sentence of paragraph three, scripture does not present election and damnation in such a neat parallelism. It's just a general caution. So when people will post on Facebook, he'll be praised for his grace and praised for his justice when people are screaming in hell. Like, we are not. That is not a responsible use of language. That misrepresents the asymmetry in Scripture between election and reprobation. We must be careful with our language. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to refer you to just different sections. Um, but because of these differences, again, be careful with grammar and... Um, be careful, especially when grammar seems to coordinate predestination and reprobation, like in one fell swoop. One, one last quote from Bavink, because he's Bavink. He says, The formulation of the ultimate goal of all things, as God's will to reveal his justice in the case of the reprobate and his mercy in the case of the elect, is overly simple and austere. So but he's basically saying what I just said. Like, it's overly simplistic and austere to just say, he'll be praising his grace for redemption and praising his justice for reprobation and then just move on without clarifying how scripture presents those things as asymmetrical. Um, uh, yeah. Let's, do, do you guys have any questions? I'm going to read one quote and ask if there are any questions, okay? Last quote from Bavik, and I think this is really helpful. If we accept the doctrine of reprobation, that does not mean that we are less loving and less gentle than those who reject it. Here's a long quote from Bavink that I'm, I try to simplify. The difference between people like Calvinists who affirm the doctrine of reprobation and those like Pelagians who reject it is not that the latter were that much more gentle, loving, and tender-hearted than the former. On the contrary, the difference is that the Calvinists accepted Scripture in its entirety, also including the doctrine of reprobation, that they were and always wanted to be theistic, God-centered, and recognize the will and hand of the Lord also in these disturbing facts of life that they were not afraid to look reality in the eye, even when it was appalling. Pelagianism scatters flowers over graves, turns death into an angel, regards sin as mere weakness, lectures on the uses of adversity, and considers this the best possible world. Calvinism has no use for such drivel. It refuses to be hoodwinked. It tolerates no such delusion, takes full account of the seriousness of life, champions the rights of the Lord of hosts, and humbly bows in adoration before the inexplicable sovereign will of God Almighty. As a result, Calvinism proves to be fundamentally more merciful than Pelagianism. Calvinism comforts us by saying that in everything that happens, it recognizes the will and hand of an almighty God, who is also a merciful father. While Calvinism does not offer a solution, it invites us humans to rest in him who lives in unapproachable light, whose judgments are unsearchable, and whose paths are beyond tracing out. So with that, we'll end this part. We'll have to pick up question five next time. But it is not somehow more harsh to accept the doctrine of reprobation. 
Calvinism in accepting this doctrine is actually more merciful because we're staring reality in the face and we're, we're, we're wrestling with something scripture doesn't fully answer, but how do we resolve it? We're resting in the hand of the Almighty, in the good character of God. And that's where you want to be. Not in the comfort of some neat solution and formula that you concocted, but in the hand of a merciful and mighty God. So let's um, close with a word of prayer. Uh, may God mute anything that was unhelpful, amplify anything that was helpful, and let's remember, these things are practical. They're to make us stronger people. So let's pray together.